It's about the judgment of Nineveh by Yahweh, by the covenant God, the God who keeps his promises, who loves those with an everlasting love upon whom he has set his heart eternally, and who takes vengeance on the enemies of his people, who will by no means clear the guilty, yet is a God who is full of patience. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Nahum, the first chapter, verses 7 and 8, and then uh, go over and mark Nahum chapter 3, verses 5 to 7. We're going to read these verses, and then we will uh, watch the video summary from the Bible Project, and then we'll uh, dig into the material we want to cover tonight. So stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read this, these texts. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an, ever, with an overflowing flood, he will make complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. In chapter 3, behold, I'm against you, declares the Lord of hosts, and will lift up your skirts over your face, and I will make nations look at your nakedness and kingdoms at your shame. I will throw filth at you and treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. And all who look at you will shrink from you and say, wasted is Nineveh, who will grieve for her? Where shall I seek comforters? you. Well, this is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let us find tonight comfort and concern. Comfort knowing that God watches over His own. Comfort knowing that He will never change His mind about those whom He has saved. Concern that He will had the final word and take vengeance on all of his enemies wherever he finds them. Thank you. Please be seated. I would remind you that the theme passage for this study is John 5, 39 and 40, where Jesus said to the religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is thee that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Just sober, sober reminder that we can be fascinated with the scriptures and miss Jesus. Pharisees were. It's a warning to us. You're going to see tonight that of all the books we've studied thus far, Nahum has the least to say about the Messiah. They're fascinating. But we learn some things about the character of Messiah as Nahum spells out some of the attributes of God. We'll see that in a minute. Nineveh was a city built to last. It was surrounded by high walls, fortified with 200 towers. These walls were 100 feet high. The towers above them were 100, another 100 feet high. We'll get into the details of this city here shortly. They were encircled by a deep moat. It was truly an invincible and impregnable fortress or so the people of Nineveh thought. But Nahum prophesies that this proud city would be powerless to stand before God's coming wrath. In the hundred plus years since Jonah's revival, the people of Nineveh had turned their defiant turn back to their defiant, immoral ways. Nahum's preaching is not like Jonah's. Jonah's is a call to repentance. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will perish. Nahum's preaching is a decree that God is going to destroy Nineveh because they have worn out the patience of God. So let's watch the Bible Project's video summary of this and then we'll come back and, and do some more of our own. 
the book of the prophet Nahum. This short prophetic book is a collection of poems announcing the downfall of one of Israel's worst oppressors, the ancient empire of Assyria, and its capital city, Nineveh. The Assyrians arose as one of the world's first great empires, and their expansion into Israel resulted in the total destruction and exile of the northern kingdom and its tribes. The Assyrian armies were violent and destructive on a scale that the world had never seen before, and so Israel and its neighbors were awaiting the downfall of Assyria, which eventually came in the year 612 BC. The Babylonians rose up and began a rebellion that overtook Nineveh and brought down the Assyrian Empire. And so chapter 2 depicts the fall of Nineveh in vivid poetry, and chapter 3 then explores the downfall of the empire as a whole. But this book isn't just an angry tirade against Israel's enemies. The introductory chapter shows us that there is way, way more going on here. The book opens with an incomplete alphabet poem that begins by describing a powerful appearance of God's glory. It's very similar to how the previous book, Micah, began and how the next book, Habakkuk, is going to conclude. And it's God, the all-powerful creator, coming to confront the nations and bring his justice on their evil. And the poem opens by quoting from the famous line of God's self-description after the golden calf incident in the book of Exodus chapter 34. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. He won't leave evil unpunished. And so the rest of the poem goes back and forth, contrasting the fate of the arrogant, violent nations with the fate of God's faithful remnant. When God brings down all the arrogant empires, he will provide refuge for those who humble themselves before him. Now, here's what's really interesting, is that you thought this book was only about Assyria, but Nahum actually nowhere mentions Nineveh or Assyria in chapter 1. And when he describes the downfall of the bad guys, he uses Isaiah's language about the fall of Babylon, which happened much later in history. And not only that, Nahum also describes the downfall of the bad guys as good news for the remnant of God's people. It's a direct allusion to Isaiah's good news about the downfall of Babylon. And so all these little details from chapter 1, they come together to make a key point. For Nahum, the fall of Nineveh is being presented as an example, as an image of how how God is at work in history in every age, how he won't allow the arrogant or violent empires of our world to endure forever. So the message of Nahum is actually very similar to that of Daniel. Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires throughout history, and Nineveh's fate is a memorial to God's commitment to bring down the violent and the arrogant in every age. With this perspective from the opening chapter, the book then returns to its focus on Assyria. And so chapter 2 describes the Battle of Nineveh and the overthrow of the city in progressive stages. So first we see the front line of Babylonian soldiers, and then we read about the charge of the chariots, and then the chaos on the city walls as the city is breached, then the slaughter of Nineveh's people, then the plundering of the city. Chapter 3 goes on to describe the results of the city's downfall for the empire as a whole. So Nahum begins by announcing a woe upon the city whose kings built it with the blood of the innocent. It's an image of how injustice was built into the very system that made Assyria so successful. But their violence has sown the seeds of their own destruction, and so Assyria will fall before Babylon. The book concludes with a taunt against the fallen king of Assyria. He's stricken with a fatal wound, and from among all the nations that he once oppressed, no one comes to help him. Rather, they sing and celebrate his destruction. And that's how the book ends. Now, this is a gloomy book, but it's important to see how Nahum's message addresses the tragic and perpetual cycles of human violence and oppression in every age. Human history is filled with tribes and nations elevating themselves and using violence to take what they want, resulting in the death of the innocent. And the book of Nahum uses Assyria and Babylon as examples to tell us that God is grieved and that he cares about the death of the innocent and that his goodness and his justice compel him to orchestrate the downfall of oppressive nations. And God's judgment on evil is good news, unless, of course, you happen to be Assyria. Which brings us all the way back to the conclusion of that opening poem in chapter 1, which tells us that the Lord is good and a refuge in the day of distress. He cares for those who take refuge in him. And so the little book of Nahum invites every reader to humble themselves before God's justice and to trust that in his time he will bring down the oppressors of every time and place.
And that's what the book of Nahum is all about. Another excellent summary, I hope. I hope you're availing yourself of these things. If you have personal studies you're doing on your own, uh, teaching, family, teaching classes, that you're going to this Bible project and see seeking out what they have. I think it's a very graphic uh, and by and large accurate and excellent reflection of the books of the Bible. What a wonderful tool we have for our day. Now, we'll do a little bit of a, of a summary to kind of give you a flow of this, and then we'll go into a little more uh, detailed survey of, uh, of Nahum. In my Bible, Nahum fits on two facing pages, the entire book right there, three chapters. And yet, a lot can be learned from what we're taught in this book. If you want to put a place to uh, where this took place, it's in, it's in Judah. Uh, though, it's, though the prophecy is against Nineveh, it happens in Judah, uh, and Nineveh is the, is the capital of Syria, of the Assyrians. About 660 B.C. is the best date. We'll show you why that's been developed. Uh, three emphases, and they're actually tied to each chapter. One is the destruction of Nineveh is decreed by God, even though the name Nineveh is not, is not mentioned. When he's saying, when he's saying, you know it's, it's got to be one of the great enemies of the people of God. And once you pinpoint the time frame, then you have a good idea of who he's speaking. And then he, then he actually references Nineveh, chapter 2 and following. But you have this, there's a verdict that God's going to take vengeance on them. Uh, he says what he's going to do to them. It goes along principles of divine judgment. Let, let's read some of uh, chapter 1 to give you a flavor of the book here. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. An oracle, oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. We're going to deal with this Elkosh in a little while. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell in it. You get this flavor of, the, of this massive, majestic sovereignty of God. And that's, kind of, that's the movement throughout the book. And so you see the, uh, the destruction of Nineveh and the deliverance of Judah is, is predicted. The second main movement is the destruction of Nineveh is described. It goes in some detail about, about what it looks like when it falls. Uh, then the uh, third section, the destruction of Nineveh, uh, comes because it's deserved. And it describes uh, what they had become. So, a little background. When God finally convinces Jonah to preach to the people of Nineveh, remember the whole city responds in repentance. It's, a, it's an incredible revival, awakening really. And they escape destruction, the warning of God that had come. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall perish. They humble themselves before the one true God. But it doesn't take very long, sadly, uh, for their humility to turn to arrogance. Uh, Assyria, it's really interesting if you read the history of this, they became a, a really prosperous people. Uh, parenthetically, by the way, I don't know how much you know of your American history, but it was the first great awakening in America that led to uh, the call for independence and, uh, and our being birthed as a nation. And then the second great awakening in the, uh, the 19th century gave rise to colleges, hospitals, 
orphanages. It was an incredible move of, of the compassion of the people of God as multitudes were converted. It is, it is so historically that when, when God moves in on a people and they respond to Him in repentance and faith, uh, that blessings come to that people because uh, people begin to live for purpose and on purpose. Well, something of that happened in Nineveh. The Assyrians became a very prosperous people. Uh, but the danger always is, God promises this, he, he warns His people throughout their history. If you forget that God is the one who gave you the blessings, then your blessings will become a curse to you. And that's what happened. They became arrogant, uh, thinking they were self-made. So God calls Nahum to proclaim the coming destruction of Nineveh. No offer that if they repent, anything would change. In fact, Jonah went to Nineveh. Nahum doesn't even go to Nineveh. He declares this prophecy from a distance. Just when I think this cough is under control. Excuse me. So about a century after this, after the great revival, God sends Nahum. And he warns them, and it'll be final when it happens. You picked up in the early verses I read about how God is described as a God of vengeance, a God of patience, a God of power. And that combination, taken for granted, means that only destruction awaits such a people. God is holy. Nineveh stands condemned because of its sins. That's found in first, verses 9 to 14 in chapter 1. People of God will soon experience uh, release from the Assyrian invasion. The second movement in, the, in this is the destruction of Nineveh is, is described. Look at chapter 2. Assyria will be conquered and Judah will be restored. That's in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. The scatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts. Watch the road. Dress for battle. Collect all your strength. For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For plunderers have plundered them and ruined their branches. And so he's going to devastate Nineveh, restore his people. And you go on and read in chapter 2 and you read about the, how Nineveh will be sacked uh, and destroyed. And that was described for us in our video. The Ninevites flee in terror. The invading army will come and plunder them. And then the third chapter tells us a little more about the cruelty and corruption of Nineveh and how its, how its destruction was deserved. Look at chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey. The crack of the whip, the rumble of wheel, galloping horse, bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies and all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings, people with her dreams. Behold, I'm against you, declares the Lord. We read these verses 5 to 7 uh, at the beginning. So this is the, this is the word that comes to them. The principle in, in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required, can really be applied to uh, Nineveh. They have been given the privilege of coming to know the one true God. They're a pagan nation, and yet God had mercifully sent a prophet to preach to them, and they had repented and come to know him, and yet they squander that privilege. You can't help but wonder when you read about what's happening, what happened in Nineveh, where do we stand on God's calendar? A nation like the United States has so many blessings, so many privileges. Where do we stand? Are we exercising those, or are we squandering those? One must, must fear and tremble 
Well, they'd forgotten the revival. Concluded that the greatness they had, they had achieved was by their own hands. And so this prophet Nahum comes. His name, Nahum, means comfort or consolation. Well, his prophecy has no comfort or consolation for Nineveh, but it does for the people of God who've been on the receiving end of, of Nineveh's terrorism. In fact, the name Nahum is shortened from the name Nehemiah. Remember what we told you when we looked at Nehemiah, that Nehemiah meant comfort of Yahweh. And so you're Nahum, ne Neha, you're, you're missing the ayah part, which is Yahweh. So the comfort of Yahweh, Nehemiah, becomes the comfort or consolation in the name uh, Nahum. It's a comfort and consolation to Judah, who live in fear of the cruelty of the Assyrians, who had seen the northern kingdom destroyed by the Assyrians. There's only one mention of Nahum in the Old Testament, and it's found in chapter 1, verse 1, where he's called a Nahum of Elkosh, or some renderings, Nahum the Elkoshite. Now, there's, I'm going to give you four possibilities of who this fellow is and where this, where this Elkosh was. That's part of the problem is we don't seem to have a definitive understanding of where Elkosh was. There was a 16th century tradition, so early, early on, that identifies Elkosh with Al-Kush in Iraq, uh, north of the site of Nineveh on the Tigris River. If he was from there, then he was closer to, to the site of the destruction than it, than it seems like by the, what he says. Second, Jerome, who wrote the Latin Vulgate, uh, believed that a city called Elkisi uh, near Ramah in Galilee was Elkosh because of the similarity of, the, of how you would spell it in Hebrew with just the consonants without the vowels. Third consideration is that Capernaum means city of Nahum, uh, and many believe that the name Elkosh was changed to Capernaum in Nahum's honor. Uh, but most conservative scholars believe that Elkosh was a city of southern Judah, later called El Elkisi, between Jerusalem and Gaza. And this would put Nahum the prophet in the southern kingdom. Uh, may explain his interest in the triumph of Judah. If you look at just real quickly, Nahum 1.15 and 2.2, where the prophet says, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, sounds very much like Isaiah. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. The, the promise that they would be vindicated. Then chapter 2, verse 2, For the Lord is restoring the majesty of Jacob as the majesty of Israel. For plunderers have plundered them and ruin their branches. As far as the date of it, how do we arrive at the date? Well, you know historically, we know this, that the fall of Nineveh to the Babylonians took place in 612 BC. As Nahum speaks of it in this prophecy, it's, he's speaking of it as a future event. So we would have to say it, that this prophecy comes before 612 BC. Uh, Nahum 3, 8 to 10, refers to the fall of, of Thebes uh, in Egypt. Listen to this. So we've got to date the book after 664 because that's when the fall of Thebes took place. Nahum 3, 8 to 10. Are you better than Thebes that sat by the Nile with water around her, her rampart of sea and water her wall? Cush was her strength, Egypt too, and that without limit. Put and the Libyans were her helpers. Yet she became an exile. She went into captivity. Her infants were dashed in pieces at the head of every street. For her honored men, lots were cast, and all her great men were bound in chains. This, this reference to something that had happened. So you're, you're trying to historically pinpoint this thing. Destruction of Nineveh has not happened. The conquest of Thebes has happened. So you're, you're between a 664 and a 612 date. And so, most people put it there, and you'll find if you read different people, some will say 654 B.C., some, some earlier, some later. Um, but 660 is generally regarded as the date of this book. The conversion of the Ninevites under Jonah took place just, I don't know if I mentioned this, around 760 B.C. That's why we think in terms of 100 or more years. But this is what happened after this. 
760, you have a revival. In 722, Sargon II of Assyria, Nineveh, destroyed Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and scattered the ten tribes. So the Assyrians, some uh, 38 years after the revival, take the northern kingdom captive. Led by Sennacherib, the Assyrians also came close to capturing Jerusalem in the reign of King Hezekiah in 701 B.C. So by the time Nahum, if we, if we position him at 660, uh, Assyria reached the peak of its prosperity and power under a fellow named Ashurbanipal, 669 to 633 B.C. He extended Assyria's influence farther than, than any of his predecessors. Nineveh became the mightiest city on earth. I told you about these walls. Walls 100 feet high, towers on top of the walls, another 100 feet high. The walls were, were thick enough, wide enough, to accommodate three chariots riding side by side. When I was in China, we were in one of the cities there, and went out to prayer walk. We walked on the wall of the city. The wall was thousands of years old. But you could literally drive two cars and have room to spare along these walls. They're massively wide. I've not seen anything like that before. And so this is what you're, you're talking about, is these very, very tall, wide, impregnable uh, walls. In addition, the walls were surrounded by a moat, a body of water. It was 150 feet wide. That's a half a football field. And 60 feet deep. And it was designed, inside and out, for them to withstand an enemy's siege for 20 years. So for Nahum to prophesy that Nineveh was going to be overthrown seemed impossible. After Ashurbanipal passed off the scene, two sons of his, Ashurbanipal and Sinsharishkan, uh, things got, got bad for Nineveh. They began to decline. And so, if you look at chapter 1, verse 8, Nahum's prophecy is that Nineveh will come to an end with an overflowing flood. Historically, we know that this is exactly what occurred. The Tigris River overflowed its banks, and the flood destroyed part of Nineveh's wall, this impregnable wall that could withstand anything. A portion of it was wiped away. And it was through this wall that the Babylonians came and plundered the city. And then they set it on fire. So you have this description in the prophecy that it will, it will be destroyed by water and by fire. And both of these things happened. In chapter 3, verse 11, Nahum says, You also will be bedrunken. You will go into hiding. You will seek refuge from the enemy. And we know that after Nineveh's destruction in 612 B.C., Think about this now. This site was not discovered until 1842 A.D. 2,400 years. The geological site we know now as Nineveh was not to be found. That's how pervasive was the destruction when God came upon it. Uh, the theme and the purpose, of course, uh, is, the, is God's judgment. Uh, the retribution of God against the wickedness of Nineveh. It was irreversible. Nothing could be done about it. God had settled it. He had shown mercy to these people in bringing them to repentance, and they squandered that. And that's a lesson we need to... John Owen, the Puritan, said something in one of his commentaries I was reading. He said, while it is true that God has promised to grant grant 
Forgiveness to all who repent. Nowhere has he promised to grant repentance to all who sin. That needs to sink in. I think people who have been forgiven by the Lord or people who know folks who've been forgiven by God's grace can draw some wrong conclusions and think, well, and I can do anything I want to do and be forgiven. I've had people look me in the eyes and tell me that. I intend to go sin by, but I'm going to repent after that, and God's going to forgive me. I've had occasion to cite this and say, you have no promise from God for you that if you go into sin like that, that you even want to repent. He gives the desire to repent. And so Nineveh, as as a people, experienced this goodness of God, squandered it, and there would be no mercy offered to them. It is possible to sin away the day of grace. John writes in his letter, 1 John, you see someone sinning a sin that does not lead to death, pray for him. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say you should pray for that one. It's a haunting thing to consider. And so this is where Nineveh finds itself in God's focus. He will destroy them thoroughly. What are the keys to this? Well, of course, obviously the key term, key phrase is the judgment of Nineveh. The key verses we read at the outset that the Lord is good. He's good toward those who take refuge in him. He will will care for them in the day of trouble, uh, but he will complete the end of his adversaries. When God says, I'm against you, it should make someone tremble. I'm amazed at how people mock our God today. Mock his son. I think I told you, I don't know if this is a group I told or not, that I saw a poster someone was holding up in one of these ridiculous marches. Jesus comes back, kill him again. The audacity of such. The frivolity which they deign to treat our God. God says, I'm against you. That's problematic. You need to brace for what he's going to bring. The first chapter is the key chapter uh, in the book. Uh, it records these principles of divine judgment. It would be good to read over that and, and take that uh, in tow. Uh, and because of these principles of, of how and why God judges, then the destruction becomes certain. Uh, God in no way clears the guilty. We need, to, we need to be people who repent and forgive, repent and forgive, repent and forgive every day of our lives. Repent and forgive. And then we get to this, what about Jesus? There, how do we see Jesus? There is no direct messianic prophecy it sets it apart uh, from the other books we've studied. Up until this point, every book we've studied has had something that the New Testament would refer back to in it, something Jesus would quote, something that is so, so obviously messianic in tone, but not Nahum. What you have to find in this is in chapter 1, verses 2 to 8. We've read them several times by now. But these attributes, these divine attributes, when you read this, the Lord's a jealous and avenging God. Jesus is jealous for his name. He is jealous for the name of his God. He's jealous for his name upon his people. How jealous is he? When the church in Acts had just been birthed and two people took the opportunity to lie to the apostles about a gift they were giving, They were struck dead immediately, husband and wife. He's jealous for his name. He's avenging and wrathful. He came in his incarnation. Uh, He said he's meek and lowly in heart. Read how he's going to come back in Revelation 19. Rider on the white horse. His name is faithful and true. Whose blood, whose, whose garment is dipped in blood. Fascinating to study that, to know if he's coming back with his garment dipped in the blood of his saints that he comes to avenge or whether it's a symbol of his 
his garment will be dipped in the blood of his, of his enemies. He will come and take vengeance. He will, he will trample his enemies as so many grapes in a wine press. That's the description of the one coming back in Revelation 19. Taking vengeance on his adversaries. Keeping wrath for his enemies. But he's slow to anger. He teaches us that. He is slow to anger. He doesn't just disrupt. We need to, we need to deal with our anger that just erupts. It's not sanctified. Jesus is not that way. Great in power. So we see in these verses attributes of God that, that we can, when we read them and we know what the New Testament says about them, we can identify. But other than that, you have no clear messianic connection. You could almost say, do we see Jesus in Nahum? Do we see him? But the emphasis in this is about an enemy of God that God is determined to take vengeance on. He's going to do that to show mercy to his, to his people. And in that you see something of the heart of Jesus Christ. Well, Nahum is one of three prophets who primarily focused on the judgment of Judah's enemies. The other two of these are Obadiah. And if you remember when we studied Obadiah, we focused a lot on Edom, on the Edomites. The other one, the remaining one, is Habakkuk. We'll be looking at uh, next. If you're from Europe, or if you've been around anybody from Europe who teaches in the prophets, you may hear them say Habakkuk. That's what they call this prophet, Habakkuk. Habakkuk is the other one. He focuses on Babylon, on Babylon. So there's three prophets in, these, in the cluster of these minor prophets that their emphasis is on God judging his enemies, the enemies of his people. And it's interesting because we know that during the time of Nahum, when we, when we put the timeline together, that Judah had its own issue with wickedness. And yet in Nahum's prophecy, there's not one word spoken of Judah's wickedness. Not one word of condemnation against Judah. There's neither a call to repentance or reformation. This is what Zephaniah, Jeremiah, and Habakkuk would do. That would be their roles as prophets. Nahum had a different role. To pronounce certain judgment upon the enemies of God. So the next thing I want us to see is some just mention a few things as we wrap this up. Nahum's prophecy, when you go back and read through it, and you can read through it in easily in one setting, had some very specific details about what was going to happen. To Nineveh. Nineveh would be destroyed by a flood. Chapter 1, 8, chapter 2, 6. Be destroyed by fire. Uh, Nineveh would experience the profaning of its temples and images. Chapter 1, verse 14. The city of Nineveh would never be rebuilt. Chapter 1, 14. Chapter 2, 11 and 13. The leaders of the city would flee, which happened in chapter 2, 9, 3, 17. The easy capture of the fortresses around the city, this impregnable city that they would be easily taken, which was thought impossible. The destruction of the gates, which were built in such a way that they, they should be able to withstand a siege for 20 years, chapter 3, verse 13. The lengthy siege and the frantic efforts to strengthen its defenses while they were under siege. Every one of these things that I mentioned have been authenticated historically that that's exactly how they happened. They were prophesied by Nahum. The book itself uh, contains only 47 verses. And one writer, I thought this was interesting, I, this is a little side note. It contains nearly, in those 47 verses, contains nearly 50 references to different aspects of nature. God's sovereignty. Over, over the nature, God's sovereignty over all things. 
And then a last note, Nahum is not quoted in the New Testament. Don't think it's insignificant as a book, but it really is strikingly different from the prophets we've been studying. And that's a summary of the brief three chapters of the prophet Nahum. Any questions or comments?